This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Company law, directors and officers. Not really a lot to say on this first page, other than a director is anyone who occupies. This is <coughs> a definition from the Companies Act in, in UK, um, the definition section, and it says, it defines what is a director, and it's defined therefore as a director is a person who occupies the position of director by whatever name called. Well, all right. Do you not find a little bit of a loop, a bit of a, a circular argument? A director is anybody who occupies the position of a director, uh, and a director is anyone who occupies the position of director. By whatever name called, it doesn't matter if you call them the third assistant secretary to the, the second assistant um, post clerk. If they act as a director, if their function is as a director, then they are a director. And it doesn't matter what title, official title, they may hold within the company. <coughs> Shadow director, of course, with a person in accordance with whose instructions the directors are accustomed to act. Now this excludes, the law excludes bankers, accountants, solicitors, because otherwise all auditors would be classed as directors because when auditors advise or, or say, or, or when the bank says you must do this, or the lawyer says you have to do that, then the directors will take action accordingly. And so you could argue that bankers and auditors and, and solicitors, lawyers, could themselves be classed as shadow directors, but the law excludes them. <coughs> a shadow director, therefore, is um, there's a, there is a, a case called Guildford Motor Company and Horn. And again, the, the name of the case is not important. I'm using this simply to illustrate what is a shadow director. Um, and Horn, Mr. Horn, was the chief executive of the Guildford Motor Company, and he left. Um, but within his contract of employment, it said, should you ever leave our employment, you will not, for a period of two years, establish yourself in, in competition against us. So he left, and he went home to his, his wife, Mrs. Horn, and he said, darling, I've left the company, I've resigned. And she says, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he said, don't worry. I've brought all the information that we need for us to set up a new company called the Horn Motor Company. And here's all the names and addresses of the people that... She said, but you're restricted. I know, he said. So I'm not going to be involved. I shall stay in the background. I won't be a director. I won't be a company secretary. I won't even be a member. Of the company. This is your company, my love. It's you that is going to run the Horn Motor Company, and I shall sit back in my armchair and watch how well you do. But of course he didn't, did he? He told her, this is who to write to, this is what to say. This is... So he was he was pulling the strings. Mrs. Horn was the member, Mrs. Horn was the director of the Horn Motor Company, but it was really Mr. Horn who was a shadow director, a person in accordance with whose instructions the directors are accustomed to act. A de facto director is a person who purports to act as though they were a director. Now, you might think, well, so what? But if they act as though they are a director and the company becomes liable because of this person acting without power, without authority, uh, then that de facto director who the uh, who has been acting for the company. Let me try a better example. The company asks somebody to enter into contracts on their behalf. The company knows, the other directors know that this person is acting as a director. He's never officially been appointed as such. There is a case a long time since I've spoken about this case, so I, I may have got it wrong. If you want to check it on the internet, then I have a feeling it's called Morris and Canson. And I think Morris and Canson, from memory, it must be, ooh, it must be 15 years since I've mentioned Morris and Canson. I think Morris and Canson is an illustration of a de facto director, even though there was some default or defect 
in the appointment of him as a director, so he was never actually officially appointed as a director. Nevertheless, the other directors allowed him to carry on as though he were a director. Therefore, the company is liable because the third party can assume that he is a director. Alternate directors, you know, I've got it in the notes. I have never, never, ever, ever heard in practice of an alternate director. Never. Um, in theory, it's available where a director is unable to attend, for instance, board meetings. He may send a nominee person along to attend it in his place or in her place, uh, and that would be an alternate director. But I've never, I've never heard of it happening in practice. It's there. Exec directors, more on these notes, because these are the ones who run the company. But the non-execs, this is a relatively <coughs> new category of director. It, it, it came really it came about because in 1992, um, you may come across it, you may already have come across it in F8. Uh, it's in P1, it's in P7, it's in P2. Um, the concept of uh, corporate governance, 1992, the report, the Corporate Governance Code, was written and published by un under government sanction uh, by a man called Cadbury, like the chocolates. Um, and as a result of Cadbury's report, uh, non-executive directors were introduced as a concept, and now in the UK. If you're a quoted company, you shall have some non-executive directors. And their role, very, very briefly in, in F4, their role is um, to bring an independent view. They provide, they help in providing effective leadership. They help to establish and maintain probity, believable probities, believability, honesty, upright, truth, that sort of thing. And they keep a watchful eye on the effectiveness of the executive directors. They, they act in a supervisory capacity. They, they um, ensure that the executive directors are uh, paying proper attention to long-termism for the, keeping the company alive rather than going into a glory uh, liquidation, a glorious liquidation. So non-executive directors, a, a modern idea, a relatively modern idea, um, and they're an integral element of quoted uh, companies in the UK. Number and eligibility of directors, uh, private companies at least one, public companies must have at least two. Now isn't that interesting? Because the minimum number of members for a public company is only one, but they have to have two directors. Didn't used to be the case, it used to be the companies the, the public companies used to have to have two members and at least two directors, but now it's only one member and two directors. Anyone may be a director, but there are some restrictions. For instance, if you're under 16, you can't be a director. Well, you, there, are, there was a case where an under 16 was appointed as a director, but he was not allowed to operate or, or take actions as though that person were a director. So even though by default he became a director, he was not able to undertake directorial powers. Maybe a non-natural person, but the concept of a corporate entity being appointed as a director is in the process of change. That change is scheduled to take effect by 2019. Must well, be disqualified under the Company Directors Disqualification Act. Again, it says we'll see that later. They must be bankrupt. You can't have a person. You, you can appoint a person who then later becomes bankrupt, but you can't appoint a bankrupt. And you can't have a director who becomes bankrupt continuing to act as a director. It must be of unsound mind. <laughs> How do you establish that? It mustn't be um, a lunatic. It mustn't be. A lunatic and an idiot are different people, are different different things. An idiot is a person with a, an IQ, I believe it's less than 40. Um, so you can't appoint an idiot. But you can appoint someone who's a lunatic if you don't know 
Well, yeah, I suppose you can appoint an idiot if you don't know. But anyway, th that's the, the principle. You mustn't be able to sound money. And should not be absent without permission from board meetings for a period up to six months. Now, you might say within the articles that any director who is absent from board meetings without permission for a period in excess of, say, six months, shall automatically lose office. That's how I always find that a bit harsh, because if you're in an accident in a coma in hospital, it's not really your fault, is it? It's a, it's a bit harsh something to discover when you do come out of your coma that you've lost your office as director. But I know that's got to be an unusual set of circumstances. Must be, it must be a, a peculiar circumstance. A company director's disqualification. This again is relatively new uh, in the UK. There were, there used to be provision uh, whereby directors could be disqualified, but now there is a register maintained. The Registrar of Companies maintains a register of banned directors. That's directors who have been bound, not the directors of a, a musical group, a band. So a, direct, a register of banned directors. An application to the court. The court may determine that a person shall be disqualified as a director on a number of a number of grounds, um, and essentially, in general, here in general, the disqualification period is up to fifteen years. It tends to be something like five to fifteen, maybe disqualified for a period of time not less than five, not more than fifteen. But just accept that generally, it's a period up to fifteen years. For an offence committed in promotion, formation, management, the creation, so from birth to death, from the cradle to the grave of a company, if a person is found to be guilty of an offence committed anywhere along the line or along the life of that company, then the court may determine that that person is not fit to be a director. If persistently default three offences in five years of filing returns, <coughs> there are matters that need to be filed reg regularly with the Registrar of Companies, for instance, financial statements, um, copies of the re resolutions that change the name or that change the objects of a company, in fact, copies of any special resolution and some ordinary resolutions. If you fail to notify the Registrar within the time period of a, the election of a director or the removal of a director, if you, the, the changing auditors if you fail to notify uh, persistently three offences within five years, then that director, those directors responsible, may be disqualified by the court. If you're found guilty of fraudulent or wrongful trading, we'll come to fraudulent and wrongful trading when we look at illegal acts within company law. But just accept now, if you're found guilty of fraudulent or wrongful trading, then the court's going to ban you as a director. You're not fit to hold the office of a director of a company. There are some some um, notable people who are bound as directors. There's a, a com comedy duo called Cannon and Ball in the UK, and they were directors of Rochdale Football Club. And they were deemed not to be fit to be directors, and the court disqualified them from being directors. And another one, a former England football manager, um, Terry Venables. He was disqualified as a director. Although he's apparently competent at football management, and he was certainly a very good footballer, uh, he's not competent at company management and therefore has been banned as a director. Whether the ban is still effective, I don't know. The same with Cannon and Ball, they may by now have served their time. Following an insolvent, company insolvent liquidation, if you've been involved in two particularly, if you've been in, involved in two insolvent liquidations within a period of five years, then you're likely to be banned. And following a Department of Trade investigation, um, if it's recommended by the Department of Trade that you should not be because you're not fit to hold the office of director, then the court may ban you. And breaking a disqualification order, now you're in trouble. Now you're in deep trouble. You may accept being banned and say, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And not only can you be an alternate director, a shadow director, a non-executive director, if you're banned, you're banned. 
if you ignore that ban and it's discovered that you've ignored the ban, up to two years in prison. So it's a big step to take. The appointment of directors. The first directors are named in the documentation that is filed with the registrar within the application to register a company. So named, named in the documents. You've got to tell the registrar who the, the proposed directors are going to be. And those are the first directors. They're often the first subscribers to the memorandum. They're therefore often the first members of the company. Subsequent directors. Now, this is interesting because whenever I used to ask this question in um, class, who appoints directors? And the answer is, well, the members do. Well, of course they do. That's, that's the basic premise, that the members of a company should be the people that appoint the directors who are going to be responsible for running the members' company. But it doesn't stop there, because if there is a casual vacancy on the board, the directors normally, typically, have the power themselves to appoint somebody to fill that casual vacancy. Now that casual vacancy filler, the person appointed to fill the casual vacancy, will typically, according to the articles, typically have to resign at the next annual general meeting and submit themselves for re-election if they choose to do so. So members, that's the big one. That, that is enormous, like 95% of the situation would normally be the case when members elect or re-elect in the event of an annual general meeting. But it may be by other directors to fill a casual vacancy between general meetings. The court has the power to appoint people as directors and, and, and to give them titles. There, there was a famous case, 1958 case, where um, the court in, became involved in the company. The case was a case called re H. R. Harmer. And the court got involved and they said to the, the major shareholder, the, the major vote owner, who was 94 at the time, they said, We're going to appoint you as life president and we're going to strip you of all your voting power. And the court got involved and, and was able to do that and, and shuffle around and juggle around the composition of the board of directors. So it's very rare, but the court has this power. A lender, if it's part of a loan agreement, if, if you ask me to lend your company money, and I say, well, yes, all right, I will do, but I would like representation on the board, so I want the power to appoint someone to represent me on your board of directors. Now, in theory, if I had the power to appoint two directors or a majority of the board of directors, that would then give me power over that company. So there's you on your own and you ask to borrow money and I say, yes, OK, but I'm going to add two people in there to look after my affairs. Fine. Not a lot you can do about that. There is a case there called Re A and B C Chewing Gum. Where um, a lender appointed uh, A to be their representative. A, A was already a director, and they said, Well, if we lend you money, we want you already director to represent our affairs. But then they decided they didn't like A, so instead they wanted to appoint somebody else into that. And A, so A and B said, No, 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 you can't do that. It's either him or it's me, but it can't be, but it can't be some new person. And of course, well, yes, it can actually. So a lender, as part of the loan agreement, should be able to, or could be able to appoint a director. And finally, the administrator, under an administration order, they take control of the company during the period of administration. And in taking control, they may either elect or choose the existing directors to assist in the administration, or they may suspend those existing directors and say, no, 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 you stay out of this. I'm going to bring in some new people to run the company during the period of administration. 
The one-third rotation procedure exists if it's within the articles. <clears throat> if we have, say, seven directors, um, and the one-third rotation procedure is established in the articles, then the number nearest one-third, well, at the first annual general meeting, they all resign. At the second annual general meeting, the number nearest a third, which is two, will resign and submit themselves to re-election. At the next annual general meeting, at the third, therefore, annual general meeting, two again will resign and submit themselves to re-election. At the fourth annual general meeting, those remaining three will resign and submit themselves to re-election. Now, how do you work out which two are going to resign? Well, it's, it's drawing straws. So you, you, you have five straws, but of course they're covered or you can't see how, how long they are. And the two that draw the short straws will be the two who are submitted themselves for re-election in that first year, that second year. So that's how we determine. Now, and again, it's the third rotation procedure still does apply. But nowadays, under the principles of corporate governance, Cadbury Report, United Kingdom Combined Code, for a public company, all directors, this is the FTSE 350, top 350 companies, all directors retire and resign each year and submit themselves for re-election if they choose to. So all directors every year will resign and resubmit themselves or submit themselves for re-election. But it's only for the top 350, so by definition, public quoted companies. Directors are appointed by ordinary resolution and the registrar is notified. There's a special form, which send it off and the registrar will make a note of it. And of course, the company secretary will write the details of the directors within the register of directors. It's actually a combined register, register of directors and secretary. But those details will be written and the registrar notified and the registrar will advertise the appointment or reappointment of directors within the registrar's own newspaper. It's called the Gazette. The Registrar's Gazette. Um, and it, it's, it's a newspaper because no crossword, there's no women's page, there's no sports page, no news items, no world news or sports news or anything like that. It's simply a boring old publication which says the following uh, companies have notified us of the appointment of these directors, blah, 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 and John Smith, blah, 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 and, and list the company and the directors. And, and these following companies have changed their name. These companies have been incorporated. And these companies have moved their registered offices. And it's just list after list after list after of boring stuff. But that's the Registrar's Gazette, the, the, the Gazette. Well, it used to be called the London Gazette, but London has now been scrapped. Now then, we know that directors are appointed by ordinary res resolution, but they're also removed by ordinary resolution. But there is something special about this, and it's the notice period. It's just an ordinary resolution, one more than one more than half to get rid of the of, of the people who vote, who are attend, who are entitled to attend and vote, and who do attend and who do vote uh, in favour of the removal of the director. So it just needs um, eighty seven against eighty six or. 5,087 against 5,000, 5,087,001 uh, against 5,807,000. So it just needs one more vote in favour. It's an ordinary resolution, but the notice period is special. Remember, and I don't want to confuse you here, and, and traditional students do get very confused with this, a special resolution requires a 75% majority and 14 days notice. An ordinary resolution requires a simple majority, but the notice period is particularly special. And it's special in two ways. 
ordinary resolutions don't normally need any particular notice period. Some require no notice period at all. Some require three days notice. But it really depends on the type of meeting where the resolution is to be proposed. And if it's an annual general meeting, that needs 21 days notice. If it's just an other general meeting of members, that requires 14 days notice. So while you're sending out the notice of the meeting, you might as well send out notice of the resolution as well. But a resolution to remove a director before the expiration of his term of office requires a, a two-part notice requirement. You must first of all give the affected director 28 days notice that a resolution is going to be proposed at a, the forthcoming meeting to remove this person as a director. So 28 days before the meeting, you tell the director in Hogg, you say, I'm sorry about this, Simon, but we have received a request to propose a resolution to remove you. And we're going to have to call a meeting no earlier than 28 days after us telling you. And that resolution will be heard at that meeting. We've not told the shareholders yet, the members, that we're going to have a meeting. We've just told Simon. The meeting has to have 21 days notice. So we have to notify the members of the company, not later than three weeks before the scheduled date for the meeting, clear days. Now, why that seven days difference? There's the meeting. There's 21 days and there's 28 days. Why do we have this seven day period? And the answer is it gives Simon the opportunity to write reasons, written representations, why in all fairness, he feels he should not be removed as a director. He may say that he's the best thing that's ever happened to this company and he's done this and here's his track record and what a wonderful person he is and he's honest as the day is long and, and you're all making a terrible mistake by removing me. And he's allowed to, to write these written representations of reasonable length and reasonable length is not greater than 1,000 words. And written representations of reasonable length are not defamatory in nature. There and not defamatory in nature. Defamatory is character assassination. It's nastiness. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to this company. I'm the only director on this company that is honest and true. And all the other directors are guilty of fraud and theft and, and murder and, and stealing goods from the, uh, from the warehouse. But I'm the one who's good and I'm the one that's honest. Now, if he starts character assassin, assassinating the other directors. That's not acceptable. So he makes his written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. And the other director sub submits these to the company within that seven day period, within that seven day period, submits them to the company. And so long as they're not defamatory, then the company will circulate these written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. He will circulate them, the company will circulate them at the same time as the meeting is, the notice of the meeting is sent out. If they are defamatory in nature, the company may apply to the court and say, do we really have to send these out? Do we not, would you not agree that, that these are just a little bit defamatory? And the court may say, yes, they are, They're, they are defamatory. So they may be uh, excused from circulating these written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. If our director Simon submits his written representations and it's too late, that he didn't do it within the seven days, notice has already been sent. Notwithstanding that, at the meeting, Simon is allowed to go with his written representations and say, uh, I'm the director that you're proposing to remove. And I'd 
prepared my written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature, and I am statutorily entitled to read these out to you. And it's no good you, the other directors turning up the, the music and the loudspeakers so that you can't hear my voice. I am entitled to attend, to speak and to be heard with my written representations of reasonable length that are not defamatory in nature. If it's the members who are asking to have Simon removed, there is a requirement in order to prevent silly requisitions. You know, my neighbour is a director and, and I don't like him because he's, he keeps cutting down my best plants. So I bought a share in his company and now I'm going to ask that he be removed as a director. Well, you can't do that. That's petty. That's nonsense. So there has to be not fewer than 100 members holding on average, not less than, on average, not less than £100 worth of share capital each. That's to prevent frivolous actions. I don't know, do you know the word frivolous? Frivolous actions. Uh, silly, petty, little um, nastiness. So 100 members holding on average, not less than 100 share capital on average. Notice goes to the registrar of this special note, the special notice. This 28 days special notice, a copy goes to the registrar, copy goes to Simon himself. Um, and when Simon writes his written representations, they go to the registrar as well. Uh, and may go to the court, and the court may or may not say yes or no, yes defamatory or no, not defamatory. And then they get circulated, if they are not defamatory, they get circulated to the members. Weighted voting rights can, can make removal impossible. Do you remember uh, father and daughter one, daughter two and son? And son weighted voting rights, his hundred shares counted three times the amount where, he, where any of those directors was proposed to be removed. Then the affected director had three times the normal voting power. So weighted voting rights can um, stop nasty dismissals by older sisters and the company may have to pay substantial damages remember again in the lecture on uh, alteration of articles it may be that the company is faced with having to pay substantial damages for breach of contract statutory duties of directors many of these duties were common law duties they um, they existed uh, before companies like 2005, 2010, but now they're written into statute uh, and they're, they're here. 2006, I put into statute many of the principles. <sighs> here we go. Directors must act within their powers. Their powers are determined, are, are established by the membership, uh, and they're encapsulated within the articles. So they should not act beyond those powers. They should act. They should not act. Or should not act ultra vires. I wrote this on the screen for the last lecture. They should not. Their actions should not be beyond their powers. So act within their powers. They should perform their duties with reasonable skill, care, and diligence. But you see, anybody can be a director. As long as they're not under sixteen, they're not bankrupt. They're not unsound mind, and so on. And there are people who you would appoint as directors who, on reflection, they may be seen to be not competent. Well, I sure thought you shouldn't have appointed them, should you? So, so long as they perform their duties with such degree of skill, care and diligence as may reasonably be expected from a person of that age, experience and qualification, so long as they do that, as long as they're doing their best, then they're satisfying the law. You and I are directors in a, a company, and it's claimed that the company has been negligently managed. And the court doesn't look at the directors as a whole. They look at you, and they look at me. And they look at you and say, 
you know, a part qualified accountant. Well, there is a degree of skill and care and diligence that we could expect because you're obviously an intelligent person, but you're still only part qualified. And then they look at me and they say, God, Michael, reasonable skill, care, diligence, depending upon age, whoa, experience, yeah, qualification, yes, so I'm old, I'm experienced, I'm qualified, they'd expect a rather substantially greater degree of skill, care and diligence from me than they would from you. Promote the success of the company. We'll see greater detail about what's involved in promoting the success. Independent judgment, they bring to their office independent judgment. You may say, well, how can they be independent if they're directors of the company? They need to be, they need to exercise their skill, care and diligence for the benefit of the company and should set aside their own personal interests. Is it good for me, but bad for the company? In which case we won't do that. Is it good for the company, but bad for me? Well, I have to set aside my personal wishes and follow the route which is good for the company. So bringing this as though they were truly independent, what is best for the company approach. They should avoid conflicts of interest. They should, for instance, um, not be involved by having shares in another company uh, and maybe taking an active part in that other company, maybe being paid by that other company in order to operate this company, our company, uh, in the best way that this other company would like us to do. So we have a company where directors have shares in one, directorship in one, shares in another. They should ignore their shareholding in the other and act for the benefit of our company. No benefits, no bribes, no benefits. Bribery, there's a bribery act now, 2010 I think it is, um, which makes it a criminal offence for a, a, an English officer, uh, a director, senior employee, to accept bribes. It's a criminal offence. It's punishable by prison. So no benefits from third parties. <coughs> yeah, you can receive benefits, so long as you declare them. So long as you declare them to the company. Look what, look what this person has given to me now. But that would be, even that would be um, ill-advised for a director to accept benefits from a supplier company, for instance. If the supplier company says, oh, let us take you on holiday, you and your wife and your family, let us take you on holiday to the... Uh, Caribbean or the Maldives or the Seychelles or somewhere exactly like that, that would be inappropriate for a director to accept such a present. It's basically a bribe, isn't it? And declare an interest in transactions, transparency, declaring an interest in contracts. Act within their powers. Perform with due skill, care and diligence. Promote the success of the company, independent judgment. Avoid conflict, no benefits, total openness and transparency. Those two are theatrical, aren't they? Acting and performing. Promote success of the company. My home football team, a number of years ago now, finished um, fourth in the league. And the top three automatically get promotion. And they, oh, they finished third. Got that wrong, sorry. Top two automatically get promotion. My team finished third. And on the same number of points as this one, 87 points, my team finished with 87 points. The difference was goal difference. And if we had scored one more goal in any one of those 46 matches, my team would have been second and would have been automatically promoted. So when you're thinking about this list, acting, performing, promote the success of the company, just think about my team. They're now at the bottom of that same league, right at the very bottom. Independent judgment, 
acting for the benefit of the company. Avoid conflicts of interest. Ah. Keep away from any conflicting situation. No bribes, no benefits that are undisclosed. And uh, declaring an interest, total openness. Openness. Declare an interest and be open and honest so that uh, there is no question as to your integrity. Common law cases, which the courts will follow in interpreting, will follow. There they are. These are all illustrations of the principles which are now written in statute. The modern F4 exam will not allow you to demonstrate your knowledge about cases, case names, case dates, case principles, sorry, case facts. You don't have that opportunity. By all means, look those up. They're all on the internet. Look them up, read the story. They're all interesting. But if you remember those statutory duties, that should be sufficient to get you through a question on that bit. Promoting success. Statute is trying to encourage long-termism. We're trying to... You can't guarantee. You can't guarantee that a company will be successful. But we can take reasonable steps to try to secure the long-term success of the company. And if we can do that, then everyone should benefit. If a company goes into a liquidation, there's only one person benefits, and that's the liquidator. The employees lose their jobs, the suppliers lose their customers, the um, customers, our own customers lose their supplier. We no longer can provide them with goods. They have to go looking elsewhere. The taxman loses his revenue from the company profits. The government's faced with having to pay unemployment benefits. Nobody, the auditor loses a client. The only person who's going to benefit is the liquidator. So we're trying to ensure long-term success, Cadbury Code, combined uh, corporate governance code, trying to success, try, trying to um, promote the success of the company. And there are a number of things that the directors statutorily must do in order to try to promote this success. And here they are. We, directors have regard for all stakeholders. The stakeholders is anybody that has any interest, direct or indirect, in the success or failure of the company. Think about that. We're all of us stakeholders in every company. We are all of us stakeholders because I'm a stakeholder in some company in Pakistan because if that company in Pakistan pollutes that sounds like I'm being racist there but I'm not a, a company anywhere is guilty of polluting the atmosphere rivers um, the environment that affects me a long long way away but it affects me, it affects the human race. We're all of us interested in the activities of every company and every individual. Do you know there's 1.3 billion plastic bottles produced every single day? Where do they go? The whole islands of them floating around the oceans. Where all of us directors have to have regard for all stakeholders, not just the immediate ones, the, the employees, the bank, the auditors, the directors, but also the ones who are not directly involved. I should have included within that other lot suppliers and customers. But what about all the families? What about the schools in the neighborhood? What about the university courses which sponsor the company? What about the local fuel station that provides the fuel for the cars that the employees drive? What about all of these? All of these are stakeholders, direct, indirect, internal, external. They're all stakeholders and directors should bear in mind what's best for the economy, for the environment, for all stakeholders. Isn't an unexhausted list of matters for directors because I'm not going to read those through. Look, I'm not going to insult you by reading them out. 
you read them. Controls on directors. Service contracts. Directors should not have service contracts that exceed two years. If it's a public company, it's recommended that those service contracts should not exceed one year. And, and if they do, then compensation payable in the event of termination should not exceed one year's salary. A one year's salary for some of these directors, one year's salary is in the hundreds of thousands. I mean, one or two cases, it's actually a seven figure sum. But service contracts, anything greater than two years requires approval by the members, and certainly there should not be redundancy pay greater than 12 months salary. Acquisition of non cash assets needs members' approval if it's greater than 10%, but if not less than 5,000, nobody cares. What's all this about? A director of a company acquires a non-cash asset from the company. It's greater than 5,000, it's less than 100,000, but it is greater than 10% of the company's assets. If that's the situation, the company should seek the approval of the members in general meeting to approve this transaction with the director, where the director is acquiring greater than or equal to 10% fair value of the company's net assets, company's assets. So if it's less than 5,000, nobody cares. That's called de minimis. De minimis provision, nobody cares. Think about it. I'll, I'll come back to that thing. If it's greater than, greater than 100,000 every time, it doesn't matter what percentage of company assets, if it's greater than 100,000, it needs approval. If, it's, if we were to think about this 5,000, imagine a situation where directors at work and, and the director's husband rings up his wife and says, we've run out of cornflakes. She's a director of Kellogg's. We've run out of cornflakes. Can you bring some home with you? And she says, yes, all right. Okay, I'll just call a meeting of members to approve this acquisition of a non-cash asset. Um, so the meeting will take place in three weeks time. Can we last for three weeks, do you think? <coughs> Stupid, isn't it? Stupid. So if it's less than 5,000, nobody cares. If it's greater than 100,000, we all care. Otherwise, if it's in the range of 5 to 100, is it greater than 10% of the company's assets? Here's interesting as well. No company may lend money, nor provide security, no guarantee a loan to a director of itself nor of its holding company unless it's approved by members. There's our company. There's Director A. There's Mrs. A, who's not a director. There's Child A. Again, not a director. There's um, Company B is a director, and Company B has a director called A, who's the same person who's a director up here. Okay. Um, so, we've got here a uh, director C and a director D. And the company can't guarantee a loan that C has taken from the bank. The company's not able to, to guarantee that. But if that was Mrs. C, and C is a director, Mrs. C has borrowed money from the bank. There's nothing to prevent the company from guaranteeing that. There's nothing to prevent the company from guaranteeing uh, a loan about providing security for child D, where D is the director and child isn't, there's nothing to prevent that in the law. The, the law says no company shall lend money, guarantee, nor provide security, neither to a director of itself nor of its holding company. Yeah, what about what about F, the holding company, the parent company? 
and F has got its own directors. Why can this company not lend to G because the law says it can't? G is a director of the parent company. But what about this? What about F company lends money to A, a director of the subsidiary? No company may lend money, guarantee, nor provide security. No company can lend money, guarantee, provide security to a director of itself, nor of its holding company. But there's nothing in law that says that a parent company cannot lend, guarantee, nor provide security for a director of its subsidiaries. Can our company lend money to child A? Why not? Child A is not a director. Can our company lend money to company B? Yes, it can. Can company B lend money to A? No, it can't. Because A is a director of our company. I'll say it again. No company may lend money, guarantee, nor provide security to a director of itself, nor of its holding company. But the law is so open and so loose that it's like trying to catch water in a bucket where the bottom has fallen out of the bucket. The only thing that a company can't do, cannot do, is it can't lend money, not provide security, nor guarantee a loan to directors of itself or of its holding company. But it can do anything else. Now that's for all companies. For public companies, it's now really watertight. For a public company, it, it, it extends the principle. Why is this not moving? It extends the principle. No company that provides security its members or not, unless it's approved by the members, to connected people. For it's a public company, the relevant company restrictions apply also to connected persons. And a connected person is the wife, the children, the partners, the business associates, peer members of the uh, trust, where the director is a beneficiary and virtuous, it spreads it out a lot further. Um, so it's like ripples in a ripples in a pond. The, the ripples spread out and, and take in all these levels of connected people. But that's for public companies, relevant companies, not just public, relevant companies. Relevant companies also cannot quasi lend. They cannot unless it's less than five thousand. They can't effectively lend even though it's not a loan. They can't provide uh, credit transactions unless it's less than 10,000, in which case they can, unless that's approved by members. Any company may lend up to 5,000 because nobody cares, anything less than 5,000, no problem. Loans by money lending companies are exempt from this because in the ordinary course of events on normal trade terms, why should a director not borrow money on ordinary terms available to you and to me? Why should a director not also be able to borrow on those same terms? Okay. Where the company and or director are in default, there are remedies available. And make them account for the personal gain. Let them pay it back. Make them indemnify the company against any loss caused by their negligence. This is not just for money lending. This is where a director has been negligent. There's a, this case, Pavlidis and Jensen, and the other one, Daniels and Daniels. These are both illustrations of negligence. But in the first one, Pavlidis, the directors of the court described them as an amiable, you may not know that word, amiable bunch or collection of idiots. They were, they were just totally incompetent. But hey, if you've got incompetent directors, that's your fault. You elected them. So you can't 
you can't expect to hold a director liable for negligence if they're acting to the best of their ability. It's just that their ability is, is not up to standard. But Pavlidis, no, sorry, but Daniels and Daniels, this is where Mr. and Mrs. Daniels and 75% of the company, they were in control. It's a family company. And they allowed the company to sell Mrs. Daniels a piece of land for £25,000. And six months later, she was really lucky here, because six months later she sold that same piece of land for £125,000. And Brother Daniels found out about just how lucky Mrs. Daniels had been. And he said, they, this, this can't be right. You should not be able to make 100000 out of this unfairly. And they said, well, we're sorry, we didn't realise that the land was worth quite so much. And the court said, well, Pavlidis and Jensen, yeah, negligence. Yes, you were negligent. But whereas you have to put up with the incompetence of incompetent directors, you should not have to put up with the incompetence of directors who make a personal gain out of their incompetence. But ladies and Jensen, they did. They, they were guilty of selling a mine, an asbestos mine, an asbestos, to a big asbestos company at a, at a gross undervaluation. And Pavlidis and others found out about this and sued Jensen and the other directors who were negligent, incompetent. But Pavlidis lost because you may have to put up with the foolish and unwise ways of incompetent directors, but you shouldn't have to put up with those foolish and unwise ways that result in those same directors deriving a personal benefit. We can rescind the contract where the directors have been guilty of a conflict of interest. Or I can ask the court to declare a transaction is ultra vires. Directors are not liable. This is different from partnerships here. If you're a member as a partner, you're liable for the silly acts of your other partners. But directors are not liable for the acts of other directors. So if one director is fraudulent, it doesn't mean all directors are fraudulent. One director steals money, it doesn't mean all directors have stolen money. Maybe held liable by the court looking behind the veil of incorporation. They did do in that case Guildford Motor Company and Horn, where Mr. Sh Mr. Horn was a shadow director. 